This is Paul Schneiderman today in the 46th edition of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. I have a very special guest today, Steve Steinberg. Steve is a, a Seattle resident. He is a former owner of an apparel business. He's an author and baseball historian of the early 20th century. As the spring and major league baseball season is underway, it's a lot of fun to have a baseball history discussion today with Steve. So I'm going to go, go back in a minute, give you a further introduction, but I want to go through a few housekeeping things here. Um, today as my engineer, I have Daniel Billis. Daniel is also the host of the Fresh Juice Show at Rainier Avenue Radio. I want to mention we have a lot of good programming going on at Rainier Avenue Radio in our sports department. or on the World Wide Web at RainierAvenueRadio.world. Uh, Rick Dupree, a longtime CL Broadcasting gentleman, hosts a great show, One on One with Dupe. Granville Emerson, Ronald Laurent, hosts a great show, Lidline Sports. Masvita Marari hosts the sh- a show, Seattle Sports Weekly. Pat McCarthy, Masvita, co hosts a show in the Seattle Metro Sports Conference. Uh, Mark Bryant has a fitness based show, Fitness Corner. Juan Cotto and Mike Cobrezi host, also host a new sports show. So I want to throw a plug for a few of my Rainier Avenue Radio sports colleagues and also my engineer today, Daniel. Um, well, I'm going to give you a little more of an int- introduction, Steve. Uh, Steve Steinberg is the author of several baseball books. As noted, he has a special focus on early 20th century baseball history. Steve has published many articles on baseball in various journals. I learned that Steve received the 2007 McFarland SABR Baseball Award, honoring authors, the best articles on baseball history. Uh, Steve wrote a book on the late, great pitcher, Christy Mathewson, that won that award. Steve's a member of the Society of the American Baseball Research. Steve's been interviewed on many national sports shows. His books have been reviewed in the New York Times, National Review, Washington Post, and other major publications. Steve's books, he's written several. Uh, he's written two with Lyle Spatz. One is 1921, The Yankees and Giants and the Battle for Baseball Supremacy in New York. Uh, his second collaboration with Lyle is The Curl and the Hug, The Partnership that Transformed the Yankees. Steve's also written a book uh, about Urban Shocker, the late, um, a late great pitcher. He also edited a book on the baseball um, dead ball era World Series. Another book Steve wrote is on baseball history in St. Louis at one era. I advise all my listeners to go to Steve's website, stevesteinberg.net. Well, I think we're having a fun conversation today, Steve. Getting your career a little bit, baseball history. Well, thank you for coming on Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. Glad to be here. Thanks, Steve. Well, I want you to, I like, this is my general first introduction, I question, introductory type question I ask my guests. Um, tell us about yourself and how did you get so interested in early baseball history? Well, it's uh, an interesting story because I really hadn't been, and uh, in my career in retail, I was so preoccupied uh, by following the retail uh, world and the apparel world, but then about 20 years ago, I started reading uh, biographies, and I started devouring baseball biographies, and they were of great players like Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth, and one thing led to another, and then uh, my son, when he was 10 years old at the time, we would frequent baseball card shows. And I actually saw a, a baseball card that said Urban Shocker on the front of it. And I thought Urban Shocker, like something happened at an old ball game, like somebody was shot at a ballpark. And it turned out that that was actually the name of a great pitcher in the 1920s for the Yankees. And so I sort of got hooked on it, even though I didn't finally publish my Shocker book until... Uh, just a couple of years ago, and then I looked at the back of that baseball card and discovered that Shocker was dead a year after he had posted an 18-6 and six record for the 27 Yankees, so I really got hooked, and uh, find out more, and uh, Shocker is really what drew me into this, uh, into this world. Well, I'm going to ask you an Urban Shocker a little later. I see your great hardback book, which got some terrific reviews on, on Urban Shocker. And then, I, you know, I know baseball history, not extremely well, but somewhat well. He's a guy I never, I never even heard of. So, yeah, well, uh, You know, a lot of people, even though they're Yankee, that are Yankee fans, had not heard, or heard of this guy. And uh, the 26 and 27 Yankees won the American League pennant. They won the World Series. The 27 was the year Ruth hit his 60 home runs. And Shocker won 37 games those two years. And he was dying of heart disease in 1927. Pretty compelling story we'll get to a little later. Yeah, no, I want to ask you a little more about, about Urban Shocker and your great book. So I got a question for you. What, what ex- tell us exactly what the Society of American Baseball Research is. And do other sports such as basketball, football, or hockey have any society that promotes their sports histories the way baseball does? You know, uh, I, I think baseball was really the one that led the way in it. And Society for American Baseball Research, which is um, uh, known by this acronym of SABRE, and you may have heard a phrase called Sabermetrics, and Sabermetrics was 
basically really what pushed Sabre to the forefront and was people going back and looking at the statistics of baseball and trying to analyze and understand the game better by looking at uh, some of the statistics. But even though that it's most known for that, many members of Sabre, probably a, a strong majority, are not necessarily into the stats. They're more into the history or the ballpark or the Negro Leagues or whatever. So it is an umbrella organization like that. And I think other sports now are getting very statistics-oriented. I'm not sure that they have organizations anything like Sabre, which has been around since the early 70s. I think there were 19 or 20 people that were at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, and they decided they ran into each other, decided to have a meeting, and that was the first Sabre convention, and now it's a uh, group of almost 7,000 members. Probably some really interesting people you met through that organization. Yeah, and, and you, you really realize, especially as you uh, visit with some of the older people, I mean, when, when, when you're able to talk to somebody that's been around from an early <laughs> era, you really have a treasured resource, and, and we lose that when we lose those people. This is Paul Schneiderman, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with author and baseball historian Steve Steinberg. Go to stevesteinberg.net to learn more about Steve and his uh, great published works. So I want you to kind of give a little snapshot history primary here, Steve, on some early 20th century baseball history. And I want you to first share with the listeners how the rules were different in the sport of Major League Baseball then than they are now. Give us a little examples of how the rules were different. Well, one of the one of the fascinating things about baseball, I'll start off by saying, is that there's actually a lot of continuity in the game. And, and that's one thing that baseball has over basketball and football, which have obviously gotten very very popular lately, and you can go back and talk about somebody like Babe Ruth or Ty Cobb, and the, the rules weren't hugely different, so there's that continuity and that we don't hear that in the NFL, that so-and-so broke a record of somebody from the 1919, or, you know, Red Grange is mentioned sometimes, the running back in, in the 1920s. Uh, the game up until about 1920 was a very low-scoring game. It was known as the dead ball era, and pretty typically balls were not changed during the game. The owners didn't want to spend money when they didn't have to, and one ball might last a few innings. They may only go through three or four balls, and pitchers were allowed to spit on the ball and do different things. So before too long, the ball became pretty lumpy and uh, didn't go very far, and the idea was to try to find a hole, not necessarily hit it over the fence. And back in that era before 1920, about half of the home runs that were hit were what they call inside-the-park home runs which, if you think about it, are a lot more exciting than a home run today. because uh, And the ballparks were much bigger back then with cavernous outfields. So that was one of the big things. It was really a pitcher's game. But the era that, I, that I'm that i into really straddles both the dead ball era and what's called the lively ball era. Because starting in 1920, Babe Ruth arrived in New York, and, right. and he started a whole different way of uh, swinging for the fences. Well, one thing, Steve, I read when I went to your website, and I haven't had an ch- opportunity to read your books yet, but I certainly learned about baseball history and more about your career going to your website, is it kind of reminded me a little bit, this may not be the best analogy, but early 20th century baseball history was unique. Like, fans could watch on the field. Kind of reminds me of Little League baseball now. Fans are kind of sitting in the outfield and stuff. Like right. It, it, it was amazing, and uh, it, gradually that uh, that disappeared, but... You, you would have fans on the field for big games. Now, some ballparks uh, in Yankee Stadium or in the polo grounds the Yankees shared with the New York Giants, the owners basically had a policy they didn't want fans on the field because fans in the outfield would really distort the game. I mean, a fly ball that would go behind the ropes, you know, would be a ground rule double, let's say. And if it was the home team that was uh, at, at bat, uh, sometimes the crowds would act differently when the ball is hit to the outfield. If the Yankees or if a team was playing and their fielders were out there, then the the fans would let the ropes sort of grow saggy so that they could catch the ball. But, uh, yeah, it was m- much more of an intimate game. But, again, remember, back in this era, no no television, certainly. And radio was just in its infancy in the 1920s. So, really, if you were a fan, you only got your news from newspapers or weekly newspapers like the Sporting News, and there was another one called Sporting Life. Your, your points are really good one. That, that, that radio it was was relatively new in the 1920s. So that, that's, that's interesting that access to games for people was, was kind of hard in that era. Yeah, they, they had what was called crystal sets. I mean, it's, even in 1926, I mean, the radios were, you know, just beginning, and they were crystal sets with different tubes. I'm not an electronics guy. And that's, you know, maybe one person in a neighborhood would have a crystal set. People would gather around to watch a big World Series game. But up until until 1920, there was, 
it didn't exist for baseball. Steve, you've written about the World Series being established in 1903. And the World Series, you know, 115 plus years later is a major world sports event. Did the, did the originators of the World Series have any idea it would get that big? Or did they see it as just some expedition-type game they try for a couple of years? Tell us it, about it, it, it was big. It, it was big. There was something called the Temple Series back in the 1890s, and okay. the World Series rules were not really formulated until the 1905 series. But baseball owned America. In terms of American sports, the only other sports that were really out there, I mean, there was college football, and typically on a Monday New York Times you'd see the headlines, Brown paid played Penn to a thrilling three to nothing game. You know, the, the forward pass was uh, just beginning. Horse racing was pretty big, but, you know, there were a lot of controversies with it. And boxing was very big, but it didn't appeal to, to, to the youngsters. Baseball owned America. The World Series, even back then, was every bit as big, if not bigger, one could make the argument, than it is today. It was on the grand stage. It was on a, a, a major grand stage right when it was formed, basically. Right, right. It really was. And didn't have the competition of uh, the other pro sports. Steve, you've mentioned this phrase a couple of times. I want you to elaborate more for, for my listeners. What exactly was the dead ball era in baseball? Elaborate a little more on that. Well, up until 1920, again, uh, the, the, the ball was not kept in play. Uh, the ball was kept in play for a long time, and it really became a game where there weren't long balls, there weren't the home runs. I mean, right now we're seeing, a, for, for various reasons, a lot of home runs and a, a, a lot of strikeouts. But a typical game before 1920 would be a 2-1 to one ball game, which purists would love, but uh, people that were casual fans couldn't relate to it as much. Keep in mind that around that era, a lot of immigrants were coming into the country, and when the game moved away from the dead ball era, it would be easier for the new immigrants to understand it. In the dead ball era... Typically, a run might be scored by a walk, a stolen base, a ground ball to the right side, and then a fly ball to the outfield. Well, you know, come 1920 and Babe Ruth sitting over the fences, it's a very different kind of game. And again, if you're from southern Italy or whatever, you're trying to understand the game, you can probably relate to Babe Ruth and, uh, and, and him knocking over the fence. But the subtleties of the dead ball era were, um, were a little harder to pick up. Um, Back, uh, back I can then. see that. And Steve, where, where are you as a fan? I mean, you're a baseball star and you're a big baseball guy. Are you more of a high-scoring baseball fan, or do you like the old-school, low-scoring games? Well, I, I do like the old-school, low-scoring games because I can appreciate it. There is one big difference, though, between what's going on today and what was going on in that era uh, um, in terms of the ball, and that is because there's a lot more home runs and a lot more strikeouts, the ball is not put in play uh, nearly as often uh, as it was in the dead ball era. When I was on MLB Network with Brian Kenny, he made a very incisive, uh, insightful remark when he said, you know, the dead ball era really wasn't that dead because the ball was being slapped around. It was always in play. There weren't a lot of strikeouts, and pitchers didn't try to... Uh, games had a lot uh, fewer pitches, and that was one of the big things that made the games faster than not just that there are TV ads and stuff like that, but, you know, there weren't that many strikeouts. So uh, the ball, was, the things were always moving back then. Very interesting history. This is Paul Schneiderman of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with uh, baseball historian author Steve Steinberg. I got Daniel Velas as my engineer today. Well, I probably in my pre-show research, I probably read the most about your book, The Colonel and the Hug, The Partnership That Transformed New York. And you wrote, co-wrote this book with Lyle Spatz. And I believe the book came out about 2015. And it's so fascinating that... When, when people hear the New York Yankees, they're like one of the most illustrious sports franchises in the world. But based on your research and the history, Steve, the Yankees didn't start off that great. No, the Yankees were one of the worst teams in baseball until Colonel Jacob Rupert, a, uh, uh, whose family immigrated from uh, uh, Germany and owned the biggest brewery in the United States, bought the Yankees in 1915. He was known as Colonel Rupert. And uh, he hired Miller Huggins. Uh, to be his manager, and hug, and then they signed Babe Ruth, and uh, you know, the, as they say, the rest is history. They really took off and built a franchise, and the two men were very different, but in some ways they were very similar because they both uh, wanted to win, and uh, they literally would get sick if they couldn't win. Second place would be as bad as last place to either Rupert or Huggins, but uh, they built it up, and they built Yankee. Rupert built Yankee Stadium, and uh, which was a huge ballpark compared to any of the other ones at that time.
Well, was Rupert like a George Steinbrenner of his era at all? Was he like was he a flamboyant owner? Or no, he well, well, he he was a very dapper uh, uh, guy. Uh, uh, he he dressed well. Uh, he lived well. But he stayed in the background, and he let Miller Huggins run the team. And the Yankees had a lot of prima donnas on that team, not the least of which was Babe Ruth. And he repeatedly backed his manager. So there was probably a fair <laughs> contrast between there were some pretty tough years uh, that they had in building that team, and Rupert was just behind Huggins, and that's why it really was a very special partnership. It wasn't like with Billy Martin and Steinbrenner that they had a partnership, but <laughs> they <laughs> fell out a few times in between. Right. I mean, this this is probably a tough question to answer. It may not be the best question. I'm still going to ask it. Can an argument be made that Rupert and the manager Miller Huggins had a bigger role in the development of the New York Yankees than Babe Ruth? I mean, I, mean, I know it's hard to answer. I'm still you know, that that is that is a, a, a really hard one to answer. But they certainly had a, had a, had a significant one. I mean, Ruth changed the game. And, uh, you know, they brought him to New York, which uh, really was the proper forum, the, you know, the biggest city in the game. But uh, Rupert really showed how to run the team, you know, professionally. And, uh, and really, the manager was calling the shots. Of course, players weren't paid the kind of dollars that they are now or nowadays. I suppose the old saying, it's easier to fire the manager than to fire the whole team. Right. But there was one year that they had a tough year, and, uh, and Rupert and Huggins talked, and then... They basically said, hey, we'll get a whole new team. They didn't get a whole new team, but they got rid of a lot of uh, some bad actors and even got Babe Ruth to come around and temper his uh, his pretty wild behavior uh, off of the field. Huggins sure seemed like kind of a character too, wasn't he? Yeah, and he died very young, and uh, he was a warrior, and uh, and uh, the game really did grind him down, but he was an immensely successful manager, and he knew human psychology and back then, and he realized that different players have different buttons you got to push. I want to hit on a couple more of your books, Steve. I, it's just amazing how time flies. We've got like maybe 10 minutes left, but I want to hit on a few more of your books. So you wrote a book, 1921, The Yankees and Giants and the Battle for Supremacy in New York, and you co-wrote, I believe, this book with Mr. Spatz as well. And the book focuses on the 1921 Crosstown New York City World Series between the Giants of the National League and the Yankees of America. What was so unique about that World Series in the 1921 baseball season? Well, what, it was the first time that you had the, those two teams facing off in the World Series, and the New York Giants really owned New York. I mean, they were the great team from back in 1905 when with Christy Mathewson won three games in the World Series, and, and the Giants had the following. They had, you know, the, the, the wealthy class. Uh, the games would start, I think, 3 or 3.30 after the stockbrokers got off from work, and all of a sudden Babe Ruth came to New York, and... Uh, it was really, the series was not so much Miller Huggins, the manager of the Yankees, against John McGraw, the manager of the Giants, but really John McGraw, the manager of the Giants, against Babe Ruth. And ultimately, uh, the popularity of Ruth drove the Yankees to overshadow the Giants. And then to Rupert's credit, he did not take money out of the Yankees. Uh, he did not draw you know, distributions. And, and he was a uh, brewer, as I said. And in, 19, in the 1920s, he lost his major source of income, which is uh, the prohibition. You know, it was illegal to sell beer. And uh, he reinvested it in in the ball club, in the team, in the players, the ballpark, and uh, and they just eclipsed the Giants, who literally had owned New York before that time. What what a fascinating World Series! I mean, nearly a hundred years ago. It's just right. amazing how time flies. Now, I read something years ago, Steve. I maybe it was in Peter Goldenbach's book Bums, and I don't remember the source of this quote. But I want to give you a quote about baseball in New York City. I think this this quote applied to maybe more of the 1940s or 30s, but. Uh, they, they said in New York, the stereotype was the Giants were kind of the redneck team, the Yankees were kind of the aristocratic team, the Dodgers were kind of the immigrant team. Was there any truth to that? Well, the aristocratic team really was the Giants oh, around 1920-21. And McGraw really, like I said, the upper crust were, uh, were, were, were Giant fans. Um, and Brooklyn was always sort of the odd. I mean, technically, Brooklyn is part of New York City since 1898. But it was never really considered a New York team because, you know, these two teams... Uh, the, it was the Yankees and the Giants, and quite frankly, when Rupert built uh, Yankee Stadium, uh, the Giants thought they would wither there because it was in the Bronx, and no one went to the Bronx, and everything was Manhattan. But at this time, you know, the subways were extending their reach, and uh, Yankee Stadium was right opposite where uh, the polo grounds of the Giants were, and uh, it, it did well. So I think the, the, the Brooklyn was always sort of the, the oddball uh, group, but the Giants were the... Uh, upper crust uh, up until the Yankees took it away in the 20s. 
Well, I, I, I appreciate your elaboration of that, that uh, at one time the Giants were more of the, the elite no. team in New York City. That's interesting. Well, you know, so you mentioned this. I think in your website it comes up. So there's so much stuff in your website. This is Paul Schneiderman, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with baseball story and Steve Steinberg. I want my listeners to go to Steve's web, website, stevensteinberg.net, to learn more about his, uh, his great works. So you mentioned in your website that the famous 1919... Black Sox scandal involving shoeless Joe Jackson. The story is portrayed in that great Hollywood film, Eight Men Out. And you write, Steve, from your historical analysis, that it's a cold case and it's not been solved. Why? Well, this is the 100th anniversary of it, so we're probably going to hear a lot about the Black Sox during uh, the, tw- the 2019. But uh, there's still a lot of mysteries about it. Sabre actually has a committee, the, the uh, 1919 Black Sox Committee, which I'm a member of, but I don't contribute and uh, do the, some of the amazing work that uh, some of the researchers have done there. And it's uh, continually uh, fascinating because, you know, there were a lot of uh, people that were around the, you know, gamblers that were sort of on the fringes and on the edges. And we may never know the the total truth. I mean, even in the Sabre group, if you bring up, is Joe Jackson innocent? Does Joe Jackson belong in the Hall of Fame? Even, even I think, in our committee, you'd get some very, very different opinions. Uh, it, uh, it was a pretty shocking event when it got exposed. It only got exposed by accident uh, a year later that the uh, stars of the, a number of players on the Black, uh, White Sox and that's why they're called Black Sox, were deciding not to try and to try to lose so gamblers would clean up. But there's still a lot of mysteries uh, surrounding it, and there probably always will be. And I, I've read some accounts, and we don't have a whole lot left, and we can talk about this some other time more. Steve, I've read there are questions about whether Shoeless Joe Jackson even read it all. I mean, there are questions about his literacy. There are a whole bunch of kind of putting on the legal hat, reasonable doubt type of questions, aren't there? Right, you? right. And actually, there is an attorney who's very involved with Bill Lamb, who's very involved with it. You know, and he studied the different uh, legal cases that uh, surrounded that. And uh, yeah, but a lot of it is myths, and baseball has a lot of myths. The first myth being that baseball was invented, you know, in upstate New York in Cooperstown, when <laughs> that's not quite quite the way it is, but myths do serve, uh, serve a purpose in our society, and they, they hang in there for, you know, for a reason. There is something, there are myths and something mystical at baseball. Well, you mentioned beginning your great book, which I'm looking at right now, um, about Urban Shocker, the late great Yankees pitcher, published in 2017, a story about a pitcher who starved the Yankees. You mentioned, I believe he was playing while he was done of heart disease. Give us a little more of a quick snapshot about... Um, Mr. Shocker, and I believe one of your reviewers wrote that Shocker may have been the most courageous athlete in sports history. That's how far one of your reviewers went. Yeah, that, that was actually uh, Mark Gallagher in the uh, Yankees Encyclopedia said that Shocker was uh, a Yankee when he was very young in the teens. He was traded away to the St. Louis Browns, which uh, don't exist anymore. They became the Baltimore Orioles in 54. Right. And he won 20 games four years in a row. It was exceptional, very fiery personality. Miller Huggins actually, it was the first trade and one of the few bad trades that Huggins made getting rid of Shocker because Shocker had, w- w- was, uh, enjoyed the nightlife uh, uh, quite a bit, perhaps too much. Uh, so he <laughs> traded him away. He got him back. And by the time Shocker came back, I think he knew his health was failing and he was not really the dominant and colorful personality that had been beforehand. And I think if, if a person knows that they have a fatal disease, and I think Shocker knew he was very sick, those last year with the Yankees, it does uh, temper his personality. But he went out there, and in 27, when he won 18 games, I mean, his fastball was virtually gone as his physical strength was heading, and uh, he was dead a year later. He, he suffered from mitral valve failure, which nowadays, if you need your valve to be replaced, you know, you go to the doctor in the hospital and you're home for dinner. But in 1920s, uh, that was uh, basically a death sentence. Were he and Babe Ruth close? Um. You know, they, 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 they had fierce uh, showdowns in the early 20s when Shocker on St. Louis would pitch against Ruth, and, uh, and uh, they, uh, Ruth was happy that uh, Shocker was now going to be a teammate of his when Shocker came back in 25. So uh, he wasn't a big partier like Ruth because of his, his health reasons, but they had a real mutual respect. And at one time in 1920, Shocker said, you know, why do I love pitching to Babe Ruth? He says, why do people get on wild horses and try not to get thrown off? I mean, right. the ultimate a challenge. Right. Pretty amazing you have a guy who had a great pitching record when he's dying of a heart, is, heart condition. Right. It's an amazing story, Steve. Well, one thing, you know, I like history, Steve, baseball history, other types of history, and historians are always fascinated by the what might have been parts of history. And I know on your 
you contributed to like a baseball, what might have been type of historic book about baseball. I mean, here's one example. I mean, I'm going to get a little far fetched here, but I'll ask it. Um, the Serbian assassin almost missed, missed the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his pregnant wife Sophie. If that, if he had missed him, then I guess it was really close to World War One at the start. So it's all these fascinating historical twists. Like if Kennedy wasn't assassinated, would we've gotten to Vietnam? What, what would happen in Vietnam? Yeah, the what oh, if books. The what yeah. ifs. There's so many what ifs. So share with us a couple interesting baseball what ifs that are, you find interesting as a baseball story. Well, you just talked about the Black Sox. I mean, imagine if the, that didn't occur. I mean, the Chicago White Sox were a powerhouse team. They won the World Series in 1917. They won the pennant in 1919. They would have been dominant well into the into the 1920s and uh, would have challenged the Yankees. And uh, and what if Ruth had, hadn't left the Boston Red Sox, you know? Would the Yankees have been that strong of a team? So counterfactual uh, 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 discussions are, are, are fun. We'll, we'll never know the answer. Exactly. Fun to get in hypotheticals, counterfactuals. But uh, so, all right. Talking about baseball story here. You got some great baseball players in the early eras. I mean, Cobb, Babe Ruth, Honus Wagner. In that era, there was racial segregation. I mean, I mean, people of color could not play in the major leagues. There was, there were no night games in those days. Do you think, to some extent, that especially because of all the racial segregation, it's really hard to call those players the greatest players ever when you had so many people who were barred from because of their race playing in baseball? How do you, how do you measure this? Well, it's a, it's a great question, and you, all you can basically do is, is look at what was going on then and then realize the context and realize the era, and, and, and that's really all you can do. You're right. I mean, the, there were immensely talented black players. Of course, they were both... Pitchers and hitters. So, uh, if you look at Babe Ruth, he dominated. But uh, yeah, if there are some of these great pitchers had been there, maybe it would have been a little bit more challenging for him. So certainly, that has to be taken into account. I don't know. I kind of give those guys a little asterisk just based on there. That's my personal view. Well, Steve, we have less than thirty seconds left. What does the future hold for Steve Steinberg? Well, Lyle Spatz and I are working on another book. We're working on a book that's not going to come out probably for a couple of years on a couple of aging ball players from this era that shocked the sports world, one of them pitching until he was 50. And by the way, Jamie Moyer broke his record by just, I think, a couple of weeks. Wow. And the other one's arm was just about gone and, and won a very stunning World Series game in 1929. The first guy is Jack Quinn. The second one's Howard Emke and... Uh, their story uh, with the Philadelphia Athletics will be out in a couple of years. Look forward to seeing the book, Steve. Steve, thank you so much for coming on Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. Thanks for having me.